So this is the beginning of our study of the book of Romans. Um, maybe just a little bit of uh, introduction as we look to the future here. Obviously, I cannot cover this entire book of 16 chapters verse by verse in 10 weeks uh, that, that I'll be here in this, in this class. Uh, we will not be having this class on Easter Sunday morning, so that shortens the 13-week uh, quarter by one Sunday for us here. And in a couple of Sundays, um, my wife and I will be gone, and this gentleman who's just coming in the door will be teaching the class on those two Sundays, Brother Brickle, a very good friend of mine. <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be with you on those days, and I always enjoy hearing him teach. So we'll have a good 12 weeks here in the book of Romans. Um, in just a moment, I'll kind of give you a quick overview of the themes of the chapters that we will be looking at. Um, but first, let me just mention that sometimes I do uh, some handouts uh, in the classes. In fact, in fact, I frequently do that. I'm not going to be doing that this time, really just because of uh, the lack of time to do it. Uh, some of you know I'm, I am on sabbatical, and someday I'm going to get around to my project that I took the sabbatical for. Uh, which is my second commentary on the book of Psalms. Um, and I really do need to do that. And so the sabbatical is almost up, and I'm afraid somebody's going to ask me, did you get your assignment done? And so I've been trying to figure out ways to make it seem like the assignment was shorter than it really was, uh, but I'll still have to work on that. Uh, but also another reason I'm not going to be handing out um, <clears throat> anything is because if you wish to have what I think, about Romans and writing, not that what I think is the last word, but if you wish to do that, I have written two books on Romans. Mm -hmm. And so you could, uh, you could obtain those. One is a verse-by-verse -verse treatment, and it's got a, it has a new cover now, but this is just a sample of what it is. Title of it's Living by Faith, a Verse-by-Verse -verse Study of Romans. I wrote that <clears throat> while I was, one of the times that I was teaching verse-by-verse -verse through the book of Romans in, at Christian Life College in, in Stockton, California. And so over the years, as I've mentioned, I have had the privilege of teaching through this book verse by verse. I've lost track. It's more than 30 times. It could be maybe 33 times, something like that. And every time I go through it, I just love it even more. I mean, it just and it renews my faith and, and uh, the joy of the salvation of the Lord that's so obvious here to know that I'm not saved by works, uh, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, is a good thing. And then uh, the second uh, book that I've written on Romans is titled Themes from a Letter to Rome. And it is, uh, the difference is it deals with the seven major themes in the book of Romans, everything the book has to say about those seven major themes, but it's not verse by verse. It's just a thematic treatment. I wrote this one actually at Brother Bernard's recommendation. He read my verse by verse commentary. He suggested that I, that I do another book on Romans which is thematic. And so both of those <clears throat> are available uh, from the Pentecostal Publishing House. I think, uh, in fact, I just feel certain that the Living by Faith, the verse by verse, is available both in a hard uh, copy like this and also um, uh, ebook download, I think, from iBooks. I'm not sure if it's on uh, Amazon.com as a Kindle. I'm not positive about that, but I know it's available one way or the other. Uh, the themes from a letter to Rome. I don't think that one's available as an iBook or an eBook. Uh, maybe, but Brother Johnson, our editor in chief, is here. He would certainly know, and so he can let me know if he if he finds that out. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, if you want something, you know, in print, those are available, and you could check out uh, PentecostalPublishing.com for those. <clears throat> so um, what I want to point out is with 16 chapters. Uh, we're going to have to be selective as to what we cover. Uh, I plan not to cover chapters 9, 10, and 11, again, just because of the sake of time. I do plan to cover uh, 10 of the chapters in the book. And I'll just tell you what those chapters are now in case you want to be reading them. And I'll also give you just what I think is a little brief summary of those chapters. <clears throat> and of course, today we will start at chapter 1. That should be obvious, but... So chapter one, uh, we will uh, start with, and the theme that I've <clears throat> established for this in my work uh, 
is that gen Gentiles fail to live up to <clears throat> the knowledge of God, which is communicated by general revelation. Of course, we'll talk about that a lot more. <clears throat> general revelation, we usually mean when we say that, uh, something apart from Scripture, which is special revelation. General revelation is what comes to us through the creation. The Bible tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. Uh, and so forth. That's Psalm 19. <clears throat> that level of revelation, <coughs> revelation, and pardon my voice here today, maybe we'll work through something in a moment, but that, that general revelation is something that's available to everybody everywhere at all times. You don't have to have a Bible to have general revelation. And it does tell us, as Romans 1 will say, some very important things about God to bring people to a level of knowledge about God. That's what Romans chapter 1, to a large degree, is about. Gentiles have a revelation. They have a knowledge of God, but they don't live up to it. And then chapter 2 of Romans then moves on to a discussion of how the Jewish people have special revelation. They have scripture. <clears throat> scripture has been given especially to them. Uh, so it's another level. It's even a higher level of revelation. But Romans chapter 2 tells us they don't live up to the revelation they've received. So when you say the Gentiles and the Jews, you pretty well covered the entire human race. And so these first two chapters tell us that nobody lives up to the level of revelation they have received. Chapter 3 then brings that all together and explains to us that all people, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, are sinners. They're in need of a Savior. And then chapter 4, some great news when you get to chapter 4 in verse 1, after reading all of this about folks who are sinners and who are not living up to what has been revealed to them, chapter 4 tells us that we are justified by faith starting out talking about Abraham, who's the father of all who believe. Then it talks about David, quoting from the book of Psalms and his views on justification and so forth. It's a wonderful chapter, and when we get to chapter 4 on that Sunday, you can prepare to shout whenever that is, because it's such wonderful news. And then chapter 5 tells us that there are two men who represent the entire human race. And those two men are Adam, who represents the human race in his fall, the fact that he was bring sin into the world, and Jesus Christ who provides redemption. So that's chapter uh, 5. Chapter 6 tells us that sanctification is by union with Christ, by being joined together with Christ, we are sanctified. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to be, well, I didn't, didn't mention this, but I'm not going to attempt to cover chapter 8, 9, 10, or 11, uh, but I will pick it back up in chapter 12, and the rest of the chapters we'll look at are about practical Christianity. Chapter 12, I call it uh, the idea that practical Christianity has to do with our personal life and our social relationships. And then chapter 13, get ready for this, will tell us that practical Christianity has to do with our relationship with civil government. And you may want to stay home on that Sunday because we're going to tell you that that chapter tells us we have to pay our taxes. It's right there in chapter 13. Uh, <laughs> good question. I might give you that week. Uh, chapter 14 will tell us that practical Christianity has to do, and I love this chapter, practical Christianity has to do with relationships between people who differ, who have differing opinions about some very important things, and how even though they differ, they're supposed to love each other and accept one another, seeing as how God has accepted them. And I'm looking forward to that. Chapter 15, which is the last chapter that I plan to cover, uh, has to do with, that practical Christianity has to do with following after Christ. So those are the chapters I plan to cover. Now you'll probably see that that's a hopeless ambition after the fact that no doubt we won't get through chapter 1 today. Uh, even the time I spend on verse 1, uh, we may try to get through that verse today. <laughs> it's a real problem. It really is, but it's a problem that I have, so if you can just stick with me, we'll at least try to cover something in this wonderful book of Romans. So Romans chapter 1, and I would like it, you know, if you would follow along with me, if you have access, access to the scriptures there, uh, either in a hard copy or on your iPhone or iPad, I'd like for you to read along. I do read and teach from the New King James Version, usually, 
Uh, this one here is about worn out. I don't know, I've had this probably for probably close to 30 years, this particular copy of the Bible, after having you know worn out several before that. So this is the New King James Version. I like this translation, and um, uh, so I'm going to stick with it here for this class. We will probably look at some other translations from time to time. So Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. As is typical for these letters in the New Testament and secular letters at the time the scriptures were written, we get the uh, name of the author at the beginning rather than somebody signing it at the end. And so uh, Paul identifies himself. This is the same person that was also known as Saul. Um, we note that he does have uh, both a uh, Gentile name and a, uh, a, and a Jewish name, and, or a Roman name and a Jewish name. Uh, the name Saul, Saul, which is the first name that shows up in Scripture with him, um, is a Hebrew word. It <coughs> means asked, just asked, as in asked of God, just perhaps implying that his parents had asked God for a son. And so the names in Scripture all have some meaning. Uh, they're not just labels attached to somebody. And so uh, he comes onto the scene that way. But then he begins to be called Paul, which would be a Roman name. And Paul sounds a whole lot like Saul, but the meaning is completely different. Uh, Paul is simply a word that means little, little. And uh, we don't know exactly why his parents named him that, except that parents sometimes do refer to their children as little one or something of that nature. We, they're not here for us to ask, so we'll just guess about that. But um, he comes to be known more commonly, Paul, no doubt because he is a, an apostle specifically to the Gentiles. And that would be a name that, they would, that would resonate with them since it was uh, a Roman name. Uh, but we won't worry too much about that. This was not so much about a name change. Sometimes people think his name was changed. It was never changed. He continues to be called Saul after his conversion upon occasion in the scriptures you will read. But Paul, a bondservant. Now, the word bondservant, is uh, a strong word. Uh, I think the King James just says servant. Some translations will say slave, and that's really even a better translation. The word doulos, the Greek word doulos, is a word that means slave. And so um, we could read this just as accurately. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, and that's significant. I want to want to stay on this point for just a moment. A slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, of course, you know his conversion story, uh, Acts chapter 9. You know what a radical and instantaneous conversion he had when he encountered Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And um, he was going there, intending to continue to persecute Christians and uh, put them in jail and, and also even uh, the, the participating and making sure that some of them were killed for their faith. Um, but he had this encounter with Jesus Christ there, and it completely changed his life and instant, instantaneously changed his life, in fact. It's all just a miracle story about how Ananias is sent to him to, uh, to tell him the way to salvation uh, and all. And so Paul winds up writing a good part of the New Testament. Now, it's commonly said that he wrote the majority of the New Testament or most of the New Testament uh, when we say that, we're just talking about the number of books that, uh, that he wrote. Actually, the person who wrote the biggest percentage of the New Testament, as far as the actual content is concerned, is Luke, not Paul. Paul wrote more books, but he writes uh, shorter books and all of that, but they're inspired books. But uh, notice the phrase, he is a bondservant or a slave of Jesus Christ. He just says that right away. Now, we're going to skip over real quickly to one of the chapters that I'm not going to cover verse by verse, and that's the very last chapter of Romans. If you look at Romans chapter, chapter 16, almost down to the end of the book, Romans chapter 16 and verse 22, and it reads, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. And so immediately a question arises, wait, I thought it starts out saying Paul. Well, it does, 
So what's with this Tertius guy who says, I wrote this epistle? Well, he was uh, what we sometimes call an amanuensis. We would call it maybe in our day a secretary, somebody who takes dictation. And so Tertius is actually the name of a slave. Uh, it's a word that means a third. So Tertius was somebody's third slave. We don't know who that was. But many of the slaves in the first century, well, we certainly are opposed to slavery, but it was practiced in the first century. And many of the slaves were better educated than their masters were. Uh, many of them were skilled people, people with educations and so forth. And uh, Tertius obviously was able to take Paul's words down. Now, don't worry about that because it's all still inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's the bottom line there. That's what we're concerned about, not so much who held the pen. And so uh, we won't worry here about Tertius. I just didn't want to get to the end of the 13 weeks and you just discover, wait, Paul didn't even write this. Well, he did in the sense that he told Tertius what to write down. Paul usually didn't write his own letters. He did apparently write the letter to the Galatians. Uh, there's some indication in that little book that he did so. He even says, you know, take note what a small letter I've written to you. Uh, but he wrote Galatians apparently because he was so desperate to get that message out to the people in the churches of Galatia. Uh, but back to verse 1 now of Romans and this very significant phrase, Paul, a bondservant or a slave of Jesus Christ. Now you see openings similar to that in uh, many of the letters. Um, should we stop and think about that? Why does he even point out that he's a slave to Jesus Christ? Well, we'd have to, to realize how the Jewish people thought about this issue of servanthood or slavery to recognize the significance of what Paul is saying here. Uh, you will remember that Jesus at one time said to his listeners, you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they responded to him, free? What are you talking about? We've never been anybody's servants. What are you talking about? We'll be free. But you know that the Jewish people had been servants and slaves for most of their, well, I don't know most, but for much of their history. They were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves in uh, Babylon. They were slaves in Assyria. Even when the New Testament was in the process of being written, they were under the heel of the Roman Empire. Why would they resist this idea of you will know the truth and the truth will make you free? Well, it's because in the Old Testament we read these words, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And so as a result of that, they refused to acknowledge servanthood to anybody because they said, we are only servants to the Lord God. That's what the Hebrew scriptures say. You'll remember that even Jesus quoted that verse when he was being tempted by Satan. Uh, and Satan uh, tempted him to bow down and worship himself, Satan. Uh, but Jesus responded and said, uh, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Uh, we have to stop and think about this because we're not used to thinking of it this way, but to the Jewish people, they only served God. And so for Paul to open up his letter, as he so often did with a statement, something like, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, means that very salutation acknowledges his belief in the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus himself is God. And of course, he'll continue to say things like this through the book. Uh, Peter had a very similar way of, of talking about this. Of course, Peter didn't write as much in Scripture. But if you take a quick look at, at 2 Peter chapter 1, the little epistle of 2 Peter, which, by the way, I've also written a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on, if you'd like to read that. <laughs> uh, I have to, you know, if you're going to write them, you need to promote them. And so I have written verse-by-verse -verse commentaries on Psalms and Proverbs and Romans and Hebrews, and uh, James, and First and Second Peter, and Jude. If you're just in the mood to get a Coke and some popcorn and read commentary someday, <laughs> that's all available. But if you look at uh, Second Peter, chapter uh, 1, and verse 1, and uh, here's the, uh, the apostle who preached on the day of Pentecost, and who had the keys to the kingdom. If you look at this, notice how Peter puts it. He says, Simon Peter, a bondservant, same language, an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he goes on to say, uh, 
to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he is acknowledging, just like Paul is at the outset of his letter, his belief in the deity of Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> that makes all the difference for Paul, completely changed his life when he said, Who art thou, Lord? And when Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? He's speaking from the perspective of the uh, Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So when Scripture speaks of Lord, it's speaking of God. Really, they're synonymous terms. And so we come back here to Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel. The word gospel, of course, means good news. The Greek word euangelion, it is a good message, good news. He says he's separated to this, this good news, this good message. Verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets by in the Holy Scriptures. Now, when he says that, of course, he's talking about the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. The New Testament was not yet written. It was in the process of being written at this time. So the Hebrew Scriptures do promise in the gospel the good news associated with the coming of Jesus Christ. Of course, Paul himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, explains what that gospel is. He said the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, by which he means the Old Testament, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, which means again that even the Old Testament anticipates the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. It's all there. Uh, but then going on down to verse 3, Romans 1 and 3, uh, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so this is the anticipation in the Old Testament. It's a reference to that. An anticipation in the Old Testament of the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is also the Lord. He is, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, 16, God manifest in the flesh, which means God manifest in human existence. Uh, that's what the word flesh means in that particular context. He was truly human at the same time he was God, ex uh, manifest as a true human being. Uh, is that a mystery? Well, yes, Paul said so right there. He said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And then verse uh, 4 of Romans chapter 1, and declared to be, Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness, which is another way of saying the Holy Spirit, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ declares the uh, fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, we're sons of God, too. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're a son of God. I'm a son of God. But we are sons of God in a different way than Jesus Christ is. We are sons of God by natural birth. I had a father. I had a mother. She passed away just a few weeks ago, as most of you know, at the age of 92. I'm happy to have those genes. <laughs> Her mother passed away at the age of 95 and a half. So I'm only 71. I'm just a youngster and uh, looking around and staying for a while. Uh, but anyway, all of us have mothers and fathers. Uh, Jesus had a mother, an earthly mother, but he had no earthly father. Uh, God is his father, and that puts him in a completely separate category from us as it relates to the fact of his uh, identity. Uh, the term son of God is used of many of us. Even in the Old Testament, you can even find the term used of, uh, well, by Nebuchadnezzar. He, it's, it's used of him in a way that... Uh, you and I wouldn't agree with at all, uh, just angelic types of beings. But um, here we have the guarantee that Jesus Christ is the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Other people were raised from the dead in the New Testament times, and even in the Old Testament we have a little bit of that. But those people who had to go back and, and uh, hire another funeral director and go through it all again later on. But Jesus, no, he was raised from the dead, and the Bible says he died once, and that's the end of that. 
But um, uh, notice in verse 3, uh, before we go on, that he is born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Jesus Christ is the son of David. He's a bodily descendant of David. His mother Mary was a descendant of David, as you will see in the book of Luke and the genealogy that's given there. Even, uh, even Joseph uh, was a descendant of David, as you'll see in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. But um, there's some very important biblical reasons why Joseph was not a physical father, which goes back to the Davidic lineage and so forth coming down from Solomon. But Mary was a descendant of David from, uh, from David's son, Nathan. So it's, they're all descended from David, two different branches of his family. Okay, so uh, let's go on down to verse 5. Through him, that is through Jesus Christ, we have received grace. Now you'll find that word a number of times in the book of Romans. It's a wonderful word. And we have received grace. The very word that's translated grace, charis, is a word that means gift. It's a free gift. That kind of sets the tone for the book of Romans. Everything we're going to read here about salvation lets us know it's free. It's a free gift of God that you can't work for it, earn it, or deserve it at all. Nobody's ever been justified by works. It is God's free gift to us. And that is marvelous news that I hope we can all get hold of. Um, through him we have received grace and apostleship. Paul had received apostleship. Coming from the Greek word apostello, which is a word to mean to send or I send, he was somebody who was sent specifically to declare this wonderful message of the grace of God. And for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, just as you were thinking, I know you were thinking this, okay, well, if it's grace, I'm going to go out this afternoon and just commit all kinds of sins. I'm just sure I could see that uh, on your mind there uh, since you've learned that salvation is free. Right? You were going to do that? And uh, you look a little skeptical. I didn't really see that. I'm just teasing because I want to get your attention here. Please notice that even though we're talking about a free gift that Paul has received and that all of us have received, notice this is a gift for obedience. In other words, are we supposed to obey? Well, yes, we're supposed to obey. We're saved by grace through faith, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. But this is a kind of grace that leads us to obedience, to doing the will of God. God is not checking us out to see if we're perfect before he saves us. He's not even checking us out to see if we're perfect after he saves us, as far as that is concerned. But we are called to obedience. And if we are people of genuine faith, we have a desire to obey God. We want to do that. It's not something that we, we regret to be required to do. It's something we take joy in doing. Paul will take later, uh, will talk later on in Romans in chapter 16 about uh, obedience to the faith. And so that idea is picked up here. For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Paul was called to be an apostle to, again to the Gentiles. Now he would preach to Jewish people too, but his main calling was to the Gentile nations of the world. And then he says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So we have a calling. The, the people in the church in Rome had a calling. You have a calling. We have faith. God has called us to proclaim the gospel. Now, verse 8, we're going to discover that Paul was not the founder of the church uh, in Rome. He hadn't actually uh, been there, but uh, he wants to go. So verse 8 reads, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, uh, and by the way, that really is the only way to thank God is through Jesus Christ, seeing as how Jesus is God himself. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, uh, I like to always point out in teaching these epistles that it was very common for Paul when he would be begin a letter to look for something to commend his readers for. And he, what he wanted to commend them for, if he could find this in them, was their faith and their hope and their love. Of course, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know that it is there in verse 13, where Paul says that they, there now abides faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Uh, 
but Paul can't always uh, commend the churches he's writing to for all three qualities. Um, so if he can't do that, then he commends them for the qualities he can commend them for, their faith and their hope and maybe not their love or their love, but maybe not their faith and hope and so forth. Uh, he wants to find something good to say about them at the beginning of his letters if he can. Um, if he doesn't mention one of those virtues, then you can pretty well believe that what the letter is going to be about is an attempt <clears throat> to bring them to where they need to be in the quality he doesn't mention. For example, if he doesn't mention love, then he's going to be working on that in his letter to bring them to the place where they need to be in love. A great example of this that you can see right away is in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, I'm not going to bother to turn there now, but you can read it. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul uh, commends the Thessalonians for their faith, their hope, and their love. But in 2 Thessalonians, he only commends them for their faith and their love and not their hope. And the reason is somebody, Paul, uh, Paul says in 1, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, somebody had written them a letter but it looks like it was just forged under Paul's name, um, saying that the day of the Lord had already come, and that had destroyed their hope. I mean, they'd been looking forward to the coming of the Lord, and now they discover, oops, it's already happened, and so their hope has taken a nosedive. So he writes in 2 Thessalonians to let them know, no, that hasn't happened yet, and it won't happen until certain things occur. Uh, well, here in the book of Romans, we're going to see he commends them for their faith, which is spoken of throughout the whole world, but he does not commend them for their love or for their hope. And um, you're you would see, actually I'm not planning to take the time to do this, you can just read it, but you can see, especially if you read chapters 9, 10, and 11, that there was a great deal of friction in the church in Rome between the Jews and the Gentiles. They really weren't demonstrating the love of God as they needed to do. And so he writes to correcting both sides, both the Jewish believers in the church and the Gentiles as well, to bring them to that place where they need to be in loving each other. So it's just when you see one of these virtues missing, just be alert when you're reading through that book to that fact and look for the occasions where the writer is seeking to correct that deficiency, whether it is in faith or hope or love. So he says, uh, oh, and by the way, I can't leave that without mentioning one of my favorite things, 1 Corinthians. He doesn't commend the Corinthians for anything in the area of faith, hope, and love. Is the most carnal church in the New Testament. So he doesn't say anything at all about, oh, you're doing great in faith or marvelous hope and this wonderful love I see there. Instead, he talks about how they're taking one another to court and suing one another. He says, I've heard this gossip, this rumor about there's divisions among you, and I partly believe it, and on and on. Um, he just doesn't correct anything. And so when he gets down, uh, doesn't mention anything, rather, to commend, uh, except one thing. He says, you come behind and no gift. They had all the spiritual gifts, but they were even abusing them. And so he gets down to this discussion of spiritual gifts in chapters 12, 13, and 14 to correct their abuse of spiritual gifts. And it's there where he points out, even if I speak with the tongues of men and, angel, and of angels and have not uh, love, I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal and so forth. He gets down to the end of that chapter, and that's where he says, there's three things that abide, faith, hope, and love. So uh, he, he hits all three of those because he could not commend them for any of them at the beginning of his uh, first letter to them. <clears throat> all right, so here we are, Romans chapter 1. Are we going to finish this chapter today? It looks pretty iffy, doesn't it? We've got about nine minutes to go. We'll do what we can do here. Romans chapter 1 and going on down to um, uh, verse uh, 9 now. God is my witness from whom, uh, uh, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Notice in chapter 1, verse 1, he calls it the gospel of God. Chapter 1 and verse um, 9, he refers to it as the gospel of his son. He even talks about my gospel. These are not different Gospels. These are just the way that he's identifying what the content of his message is going to be. It's going to be a message here about Jesus Christ, the Gospel of his Son, the good news of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I like the phrase uh, at the beginning of verse 9, whom I serve 
with my spirit. The Christian life is not so much about what we can do uh, by sheer force, physical power, something like that. That's not really what it is. It is a spiritual thing. He says, I serve God with my spirit. And uh, even Jesus said, we worship him in spirit and in truth. And so it's not about works in the sense of I'm really going to impress God here by all of these good deeds. Now, again, the good deeds are there to be done, and they should be done, and we will do them if we're genu genuinely people of faith. But we really don't look at that as keeping track, of putting up a little thing, putting gold stars there and so forth to make sure we've done enough good deeds. We serve God with our spirit. God is a spirit. And that's, as Jesus said, we worship him in spirit and in truth. I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. I love that too, because that shows us we don't just pray about something one time and that's the end of it. He says, without ceasing, I make mention of you in my prayers. I'm sure you're probably like me. There are people that I pray for almost every day. Just keep praying for them. Uh, trying to get them where they need to be, if you understand what I mean. And uh, so we don't just pray once and say, well, that's enough. I've prayed about that. We keep bringing things back uh, to the Lord over and over again. And Paul does that. He's an example for us. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. So what does he pray about? Verse 10, making request, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. He wants to come to Rome. He wants to minister to these people in the church at Rome. I also deeply appreciate the fact that in this prayer, he says, I want to find some way in the will of God to come to you. It's very important to pray according to God's will. Uh, John tells us in, in 1 John that if we ask anything according to his will, we have what we asked. Jesus taught us, when the disciples asked him to teach them to pray, he said, um, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus himself was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he uh, prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We have this pattern in Scripture. The prayer that God hears and answers is a prayer according to his will. You know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul has this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan. Now, he was certainly a man of faith. He had lots of prayers answered, but he prays a prayer there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, and then, and then I'm going to kind of finesse this. He prays a prayer there that God refuses to answer. He prays it three times. Now, God didn't really refuse to answer it. God answered it. But the answer was no. <laughs> we need to realize that just because God doesn't answer the prayer the way we want, it doesn't mean he's not hearing or answering. No is an answer, right? And you, you used to give your children that answer, and you thought it was an answer, and they didn't want to hear that. No is an answer. Yes is an answer. Even maybe is an answer. Or God might even say, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know how all the ways he may, but... Let's be sure we pray according to the will of God. Let your will be done. And then uh, he goes on to say uh, in, in verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Now, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. Now, some folks think that means that we can give one another spiritual gifts. No, they're gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he means here, I want to minister to you out of my giftedness. I want to take the gifts that God has given me, and I want to share them with you in a way that you may be established. Now, if I'm not coming through clear, and what I'm about to say probably sounds boastful, and I don't mean it to say that way. But what I'm trying to do here today is impart to you something of the gift of teaching, which I believe God has called me to do. I'm not claiming to be some great teacher, but it's what I love to do. And so I'm trying to impart to you this spiritual gift of teaching. Paul is wanting to impart to them the gifts that God has given him. He goes on to say, though, in verse 12, he says, That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So once again, he commends them for their faith. 
He's a man of faith. They're people of faith. And they are going to, he hopes, they are going to be encouraged together by the mutual exercise of the gifts that God has given them. And then, uh, I think we can get down through verse 15 here today, so I'm going to try that. Uh, verse 13, now I do, not want you, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was, was hindered until now. He often wanted to come, planned to come. That I might have some fruit <clears throat> among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Again, he was an apostle to the Gentiles. 14, for I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. He's speaking here about uh, Gentiles, some of whom were uh, identified with the Greeks in that culture, some who had not identified with it, who were, they were considered to be barbarians. Verse 15, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I don't know how you would feel if you got a letter from somebody who said, you know, I want to come see you because uh, I'm a debtor, you know, both to the cultured people and also to you barbarians. Uh, that might not go over too well with you, but that's really what he's saying here. Uh, he's not going to be coming just for those of a certain level of cultural or educational achievement, but he's coming to proclaim the gospel to all of the people. It's, a, it's the message that he's been given and the responsibility. So as a result of that, he's ready to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. Now, I do have 60 seconds left. I'm not going to try to teach anything about these verses, but I can't resist reading verses 16 and 17, which really sets the theme, the major theme for this book of Romans. Verses 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, he said the gospel of God, the gospel of his son, the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, and that just means in the order of events. It doesn't mean that the Jews were uh, better people or something than the Gentiles, but they, they were the first to hear the gospel. To the Jew first and also for the Greek. Greek means Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's a matter of faith. It starts with faith. It ends in faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That phrase right there from the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament is quoted three times in the New Testament. Once here in Romans, once in Galatians, once in the book of Hebrews. Each time with a different emphasis that we may have time to talk about when we meet again next week. But it's what a wonderful phrase. The just shall live by faith. The just means those who are right with God, those who are in right standing with God. Thank you for being here today and for paying such wonderful attention, and I'll see you again next week. God bless you as you're going.